As an engineer, I've often been fascinated with the power of computers and how computers have increased in computational ability roughly 100% every two years or so. But I'm also deeply saddened by the inability of computers to do something as simple as telling apart an apple versus a nectarine, something that we all find so easy. So I'm asking the question, why is it that computers are so powerful in many ways and yet also so helpless and incapable in other ways? Helpless and incapable, kind of like a child. This little infant learns how to walk, how to speak, how to understand the world around it in just 18 months to two years. And each and every day that goes by, that little brain increases in complexity 1%, day by day by day. How is it that this child can enter the world as a blank slate and yet gather all of this capability in just a, a very short period of time? Ultimately, it's all to do with pattern recognition, the ability to understand how um, the world is put together and to build assumptions about it. Our brains have evolved over millions and millions of years, and we tend to think of it as one piece of meat. But really, when we peel back the layers, we see that the brain is built out of many different components, each of them specialized for different purposes. And all of them work in concert. All of them work together to increase our understanding of the world. In many ways, the mind itself is like an orchestra. And in an orchestra, we have percussion, and we also have strings. And in the brain, you could say that we have two different ways of thinking about the world. We have what's called system one versus system two. And system one is intuitive. It is automatic. It is something we do all the time. When, when we engage with other people or when we pick up an object and we recognize that this is fragile and it could, it could break, we don't even think about it. We just do it. System two is much more about mathematics, it's about rules, it's about grammar, it's about following procedures, it's about equations, it's about thinking hard and slow about something. And that's what computers are great at. In many ways, you can say that computers are specialized in this system two kind of thinking. And Daniel Kahneman, in his quite well-known book, Thinking Fast and Slow, explains that system one is our way of developing assumptions about the world around us. And machines generally lack the ability to create these kinds of assumptions. It's very difficult for machines to understand the world in the same way that we do. So how can we teach machines to understand the world as we do? Well, for humans, we may learn something in a structured environment like a school, or we may learn in an unstructured way, just by exploring and playing and in so doing, developing these kinds of soft models about how the world works. So we can teach machines. It's called machine learning. It's been around in different forms for, for decades. But over the last couple of years, with the amount of data, big data that people can collect and people can work with, we're starting to see a big shift in how we teach machines. Now, kind of like how children go to school, we can teach machines in a structured way. For example, by, um, by taking a data set, maybe pictures or making uh, maybe a video, and annotating it. So saying, this is a traffic sign and it means stop. Or this is a person, don't run it over. And that's kind of the, the beginnings of how we can um, program robots, such as self-driving cars, in order to uh, do the things that we want. And we're starting to see APIs and cloud-based machine learning techniques. This is kind of like having intelligence on demand, kind of like how we have power on water. We're starting to get intelligence on demand through a kind of pipe that we can just tap into any time. Now, it's fine if we have data that we know what to do with and we can structure it and annotate it. But what if we come across something that is ambiguous, something that is difficult to classify or could be taken in multiple ways? That's when it starts to get very difficult. And that's where there is a need for unstructured learning. And traditionally, machines have been very bad at this. 
and it's very difficult to program them. So how do we do it? To answer this question, we have to begin to understand how the brain itself works. There's something called neural correlates of consciousness, and it basically means if you see an apple, somewhere in your brain, there is an image of an apple as, a, as an idea, or you have pictures in your memory, and you're able to recognize what it is. And it's not just humans. For example, um, this is some research done in the late 90s where we're able to begin to reconstruct pictures taken from the mind of a cat. So this is basically what the cat is actually seeing in its own mind. More recently, we've been able to do the same with humans. Here we see um, these, uh, these pictures spelling out neuron, and we see Uh, using fMRI, which is non-invasive, we're able to find these images within the brain and understand what the brain is seeing. And in fact, we can also do it with, say, uh, YouTube clips of movie trailers. And so we're able to watch people, watch people's mind interpret the videos they're seeing, and then, with a reasonable degree of accuracy, discern and figure out what they were actually watching. So we can actually look at the canvas that is inside your brain. And as we do that, we can build up a, a semantic map. That means that we can look at the brain as a, as a, as a whole and, and point out that when people are thinking about trees, this part of the brain gets activated. And when they're thinking about cows and bricks and uh, horses, th these other parts of the brain are activated as well. And we're starting to understand the secrets of the human brain. And that means that we can translate this into machines operating in a similar kind of way, using something called neural networks and a technique which has emerged over the last couple of years called deep learning, which is basically um, where you take an input and you process it in multiple different ways that are biased. They have a, a probability, basically. And so sometimes uh, it will take a path through the network like, like this, and sometimes it'll take a path slightly different. And that's kind of how our brains work. Our brains never really reach the same thought in the same path, the same way, uh, multiple times over. That's what gives us creativity. Can anyone tell me what this is? It's a cat, indeed. But this cat was constructed by a deep belief network uh, run by Google, where they looked at Um, thousands and thousands of different thumbnail images of YouTube clips. And this deep belief network was able to create a new category called cat. Now, it wasn't taught what is a cat. It wasn't given pictures and said, this is a cat. So now when you see this, you'll understand what it is. It figured it out by its own, kind of like that child playing in an unstructured fashion. Now, software is one thing. But we're about to see a real revolution. Now, I know some of you have, have laptops here, and they probably have dual-core or quad-core processors. IBM has just announced a processor with 4,096 cores. And it simulates a neural network in hardware, not in software. Now, this is a really big deal. It simulates a million neurons and 256 million synapses. It is the size of a postage stamp. It is as light as a feather. And it uses the same amount of energy as a hearing aid. It's incredibly powerful. And it is going to revolutionize how machines think. Because it basically has the same kind of cognition as a bumblebee. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot. That doesn't sound very smart. Bees themselves aren't very smart. But they're actually very capable. A bee is able to navigate an environment. It has a complex social structure. It's able to recognize a multiple different flowers in its world. It's that capacity to understand the world around it that makes it really something very special. What this means is that machines are now developing system one. Machines, for the first time, are going to be capable of intuition. Machines are going to be aware of the environment around them, And to a small extent, they're going to be aware of themselves. Recently, we've seen um, IBM Watson win Jeopardy, a um, famous game show in the US. We see new 
companies emerged like Viv, which is created by the, the guys behind Siri as well. If you've ever seen the movie Her, it aims to be something a little bit like that. But beyond brains and boxes, computers that we talk to and interact with, we're now starting to see machines enter the world around us and interact on our level. For example, a Google self-driving car, surgical robots, home help robots, and machines working in factories, working in bakeries, doing basic, simple tasks that, until very recently, we couldn't imagine a machine ever being capable of doing. And this is going to create a huge change in our society all around the world, because machines are about to replace humans at every level. Who can tell me what this is? It's a computer, not the thing on the left, the thing on the right. The thing on the left is an adding machine. The thing on the right is a computer. A computer used to be a role, it used to be a job, and now it's been completely replaced. And we can't ever imagine somebody like sitting down and just doing sums all day, it seems crazy. And it will seem crazy in 20 years if people sat in buses and taxis all day and sat and said, may I take your order, please? Or sat and watched a room um, to make sure that nobody was stealing stuff. So we're going to see, you know, kind of lower class jobs hit by this, but we're also going to see jobs that what we think of as, as the highest echelons being disrupted as well. So that's stockbroking, um, medical analysis, even a lot of uh, legal work is going to be replaced by machines. And forward-thinking companies can see this. Google, for example, has recently bought um, Boston Dynamics, one of the foremost robotics companies in the world. And Amazon has now um, acquired Kiva, which is about to replace practically all of their human workforce in Amazon warehouses. And it's not just because uh, machines and robots are a really good tool, but they're also fantastic sensors as well. For example, the LiDAR, the laser imaging devices in Google self-driving cars, are able to generate maps of the entire environment around them. Now, a lot of people are freaked out about CCTV, but what when every vehicle, when every robot, when every drone is able to map the world with laser-like precision? That's going to get re in really interesting. Amazon are now bringing out um, small drones for um, delivering products on the fly. Meanwhile, Google and Facebook have bought, both acquired companies that um, have solar-powered drones that can uh, loiter in the, in the air for weeks and weeks at a time. It's getting pretty interesting. And I think it's interesting that the most forward-thinking companies are really jumping on this bandwagon. So is there a safe place to be? Is there a safe place from being replaced by, by, uh, by a machine? Yes, for now. Things which require emotional labor, such as nursing, possibly sales, those are going to be safe for a while, but not forever. And the reason is that machines can actually help us to understand ourselves, and pretty soon machines are going to be better at understanding ourselves than we are. Back in the 90s, B.J. Fogg, created this term captology, CAPT, C-A-P-T, Computer Assisted Persuasion Technologies. That's basically using computers to um, help shape our habits and change who we are as people over time. It's that nexus where computers and persuasion meet. And today there are all kinds of uh, companies out there that aim to increase our happiness or uh, increase our awareness of our environment and things like that. And all of these Techniques require three things. They require an intrinsic motivation in the person, an ability to change, and a trigger. So, for example, uh, see potato chips, okay, go and eat salad instead. And that's something that, that humans are actually pretty bad at a lot of the time. And machines are very good at pinpointing what is a trigger and whether somebody has the ability, you know, whether they've had a hard day, are they going to be reaching for the ice cream or not? So machines can actually help us to understand ourselves and to, to gather self-knowledge. That's going to change who we are as people in a big way. And I can't help but look at these trends and imagine, in 10 years, in 20 years, how then shall we live? How is our society going to be shaped over the next few years as we begin to see machines as possible rivals 
when we have a robot as a coworker? How are we going to react to that? Is it going to be good? Is it going to be bad? That, um, that, that million neuron processor I showed you is a far cry from the hundred trillions uh, neurons required to replicate the human mind, but that's not very far away either. And when we start to see super intelligent artificial intelligences, are they going to be friendly? Or are they going to be unfriendly? And there are many organizations in the world that are now fighting to make sure that when artificial intelligence does develop uh, intelligence greater than humanity's, that it's going to be friendly, it's going to be kind. But having a kind intelligence is not quite enough. Because to paraphrase Arthur C. Clarke, any sufficiently benevolent action is indistinguishable from malevolence. If you're really, really, really kind, that might be seen as really evil. A truly kind intelligence might decide that the kindest and best thing for humanity is to end us. And so I believe that perhaps the most important work of all of our lifetimes may be to ensure that machines are capable of understanding human values. That's how we can ensure that machines are our partners, our co-workers, and possibly our friends. Thank you.